redirect us. God's word is very much similar in that regard. The, uh, so what I want to look at is these three topics that I have listed here. Um, we're going to take a look at how to determine where our position is with God. God, God would call it testing. I want to look at the route that we take, how we grow, what our walk is like. God would use trials for that. And then finally, sometimes we need to make course corrections, and God uses discipline for that. So I'm going to go through these three topics, uh, not in a super amount of depth, but just kind of get the distinction between them. So when we talk about testing, it really does come down to uh, where's, where do we stand? Where are we in our walk with the Lord? Where are we with our relationship with him? Are we serving him well? Are there issues in our lives that we, we need to address? Um, as I mentioned, you know, the GPS will tell you exactly where you are at any given point in time. God's word is very good at doing the same, uh, especially when we're in reading it, we're looking at and we're going through tests. And if I do this correctly and it works, if it doesn't, it's James's fault. Oh, no, yeah, so there we go, testing. Uh, hopefully you can read that. It's not as quite as big as I thought. Um, the NASB dictionary defines testing as a challenge, a challenging or difficult situation imposed by God for the purpose of strengthening our faith, not to be confused with temptation. A challenging or difficult situation imposed by God for the purpose of strengthening our faith, not to be confused with the temptation. There's there's a couple different Greek words that are used um, for that, that are often translated as tempt or test. Uh, the one I want to really focus in on is called uh, dokimazo, and Vine's dictionary defines that as to prove with a view of approving. To prove with a view of approving, and that that's an important distinction when we're talking about testing. Um, it's a positive process. It's not a negative process. God is not testing us to try to trip us up, to cause us to fail. Just the opposite. He's trying to use that test to help us understand where we are and potentially um, where we can move on from that. A couple of verses that uh, I wanted to just look at, uh, starting in Romans uh, chapter 2, verse 18 from the NASB, says, know his will and approve the things that are essential being instructed out of the law. And that word approve is that word for testing. Romans 12 and 2 uh, from the NASB as well says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is and that which is good and acceptable and perfect. And again, may prove is that word. First uh, Corinthians 3 and verse 13 from the ESV, each one's work will become manifested for the day will disclose it because it will be revealed by fire and the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. And 1 Corinthians eleven twenty eight, but man must examine himself and in so doing eat and drink the bread and the cup. And again, we talk about that a lot for the, the, in the context of the Lord's Supper to examine ourselves, to test, you know, are, are we in a good standing with the Lord? before we're breaking bread? Are we, where are we at in our walk and, and in uh, our relationship with the Lord? You know, how has that week been? We need to test ourselves. Uh, and then finally, James 1 and 3, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And I think the, the key part here really is the fact that God will test us to reveal to us our actions, uh, our condition, how is our faith, um, are we walking a, a good path? And we should welcome that. We should seek that out. You know, God's word, we're told, sharper than a two-edged sword. It's going to reveal things in our life um, if we pay attention, if we ask, if we seek God's will and understanding. Uh, he's going to show us where we're at and maybe things that need to be uh, dealt with or improved. Trials, sorry, excuse me, trials on the other hand, um, in the in the GPS analogy, probably um, one of the most interesting parts of a GPS is is how it determines routes from point A to point B. You can usually set you know your application if it's being on your phone or if it's built in your car. You can tell it to give me the fastest route or the shortest distance or avoid highways or toll roads or whatever combination of things you like. Um, I use Waze on my phone a lot, even running around town, and it will 
get you around traffic jams and things. I would hazard to say most people, if you've used the GPS for any amount of time, you found that it's taken you down a route, a route that you didn't expect to go. Or, you know, I would normally go from point A to point B this way, but it wants me to go around that way. And it will, it will take you on these little detours. Those detours can be for our benefit. You know, you might see something that you haven't seen before. Um, God may reveal something to you. The NASB dictionary defines a trial as a time of great difficulty or persecution, which Christians must endure. Such trials are allowed by God for the purposes of strengthening your faith and your character. I think I have that up there. I'm going to read that again. It defines it, a trial as a time of great difficulty or persecution, which Christians must endure. Uh, such trials are allowed by God for the purpose of strengthening our faith and our character. And that's a su there's a subtle difference to be made there between testing and trials. You know, when God tests us many times, and maybe not 100% of the time, but most often when God is testing us, it's to let us know where we're at. Trials are very different in that that trial, while there may be an element of being tested, ultimately that trial is an experience that we're going to have to endure. And that means we're going to have to rely on God for it. And there may be challenges, uh, it, but it's a growth opportunity. It's an opportunity for us to strengthen our faith as we, we rely on God, um, as we, you know, delve into his word and in prayer. The other distinction, and, and I wouldn't necessarily make it a hill to die on, but testing or trials... Are, can be uh, initiated by God to put us through. Or God will allow those trials to come up in our life. Um, looking at First Peter, I'll throw them on the screen here. First uh, Peter 4, 12 and 13 from the ESV says, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice insofar as you share in Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. Don't be surprised at the fiery trial. God's word tells us we're going to be go through trials. We're going to be go through difficult times. There's going to be times where uh, we struggle, where things happen in our lives that God's allowed. And as we go through that period of time, uh, it's, it is, it's a growth opportunity. It's a time for us to really um, buckle down, if you would, and, and, persevere through it and, and lean on the Lord to see what is he going to show me through this opportunity. Um, another verse in uh, James, James chapter 1, verses 2 and 3, says, Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. So James, <laughs> love that passage. So James is telling us how, we, how we're supposed to approach trials. To consider it a joy when we undergo trials. I don't know about you, but I would say most of us, as we're going through a trial, are not feeling particularly joyful. And God calls that out. And it's important to make the distinction between joy and happiness. And those, those are very, they're, they're very different. I mean, I've had my share of trials that I've had to walk through. I know many others have, have gone through many very difficult trials. And the situations may be very different. But at the end of the day, how we respond to those trials is going to dictate how God will be able to use that trial in our life. If we're in the headspace of saying, well, why is God doing this to me? Why is God letting this happen? Uh, I'd suggest to you it's, it's pretty difficult to have any kind of positive attitude in that moment going through that trial if you're all, well, why me, why me, why, why are you letting this happen, God? You know, but if we go into it with the understanding, with the intention of recognizing that God is sovereign, that he loves us, that he has, his best in, has our best interests at heart, if we go in with the realization that God can somehow use this, despite the fact that we may not know how, we may not know why, we may not have any idea what he's doing, but God can use this situation for my benefit. 
I'd suggest to you that then we're in a little bit better position to maybe be finding some joy in going through that situation. Keeping aware of the fact that again, joy versus happiness. When we're, when we're to consider something joy, that means that we can have an inner peace about it. That we can be content with that situation. That we understand God's got a reason, he's got a purpose, he's gonna use it for good. Even if we don't see it in that moment, we can have that sense of peace, that sense of joy. Happy is very different. Happy is an emotion. Happy is, happiness is fleeting. Uh, and there's nothing to be happy about in going through that trial. But we are told that if we can consider it joy, if we can um, approach that trial with openness, willingness, God says in James that the testing of our faith Testing of our faith will improve, uh, improve endurance. He will use it and it will be for our benefit. Um, God may strengthen our faith. He might strengthen our character. Doesn't mean it's gonna be easy. Doesn't mean we're not gonna struggle. Doesn't mean that tears won't be shed, that pain won't be felt. But having that inner joy does allow us to take some comfort in knowing that God's in control, God's going to work through this, God's going to carry us through this, and with his help, we can endure it. One of the interesting things when you th go back to the GPS analogy is that also you have that ability on that map to zoom in and zoom out. And when you're very zoomed in, you know exactly where you are, what the streets are, and you might even know what the next street is. But you can't see the destination. You have no real idea of what path it's even going to take you on. But when you zoom out, you get to see the bigger picture and you oh, okay, we're gonna go from here to there and it's gonna go this way. God's word and God's will for our lives is very much along the same. You know, we can get hyper-focused on the moment. I'm going through this, this difficulty, this illness, this suffering, this pain, and I don't see the bigger picture. And I know for myself, when I can pause and reflect enough to zoom out a little bit and realize that, you know, God does have that bigger plan. And I often think, you know, when we get to heaven and eternity, one of the things we're going to see and learn about is why some of the things happened in our lives the way they did and how God used it. And we have no idea right now, but I mean, there's this, this huge tapestry of this quilt work being done and we're just one little speck on it. Uh, of many believers that have come before us and maybe some after us and, and around the world. And we have no idea what that bigger picture looks like. We get glimpses. God's word does give us some indications of, of what might be happening. But at the end of the day, you know, we need to maybe force ourselves a bit uh, when we're going through a trial to really just put our care and our trust in God and let and understand that, that there is a plan and you know, we may find out at some point what that was for. Um, and we may not in this world, but, but it's certainly the, the more that we can take that bigger picture, uh, the more we're in a better position to uh, endure that trial. And then the last one we'll talk about for a little bit about is discipline. Discipline and chastening. So discipline and chastening, words are pretty much the same um, from the Greek. They get translated differently depending on your, um, your translation that you might be reading in. But certainly in the GPS analogy, uh, anybody who's ever used one and decided to deviate from the path is, has been told, um, recalculating, recalculating. Uh, you know, to make, an, make a legal U-turn, turn, turn in this point. And it's like, no, but I want to stop for coffee. And no, but it's like, no, you need to, you need to recalculate. And really that's, that's a very apt um, example of how God uses discipline in our lives. If we get off track, if uh, we've erred, if we have sin in our lives, God's going to use discipline to, to basically get us back on the right path, to, to get our attention. And really, I think, you know, most of us would agree the problem happens when we think we know better than God. Just like we think we know better than where the GPS is sending us, we think we know better than what God wants. And as a result, we get off the path. 
and God sends a little bit of discipline our way. Um, interestingly, the definition, I filled them all up on one screen. And again, my apologies for that being so small, but I'll, I will definitely read it for you. Um, the NASB D dictionary defines discipline as the correction given by God the Father to his children. Discipline often takes the form of difficulties allowed or caused by God to bring about improvement and maturity in our lives. And I like that part, the improvement and maturity. I mean, we talk about errors and say, oh yeah, God's going to get, you know, discipline us for our error. Um, it's for our spiritual growth, our correction, but it's also to allow us to mature so that we can gain um, that experience and, and basically lean more on God and on the direction he would have for us. Um, important to make the distinction as well. Biblical discipline is used to teach, instruct, and correct. Very different than punishment. It's used to teach, instruct, and correct. And the verses I have up on the screen, uh, Job 5 and 17, says, Behold, happy is the person whom God disciplines. So do not reject the discipline of the Almighty. Uh, we know the story of Job very well. I'm not sure how happy he felt about the things that he was dealing with. But happy is the person whom God disciplines. I suggest you not happy at the moment, but if that is what is needed to get them back in their walk with the Lord, there is an opportunity there to, to be happy afterwards when, they, when they've uh, submitted to whatever the correction might be. Uh, Proverbs 22 and verse 15 says, foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child, and the rod of discipline will remove it far from him. And then if you want to turn over, uh, we'll look at this passage in a little bit more detail into Deuteronomy chapter 8. We'll uh, go through a couple of these verses in a bit more detail, or again, you've got them on the screen. Deuteronomy chapter 8, uh, starting verse 2. I'm going to read 2 to 4 in the Living Translation, and then for verse 5, I'll flip over to Nasby. Um, so verse, uh, chapter 8, verse 2, remember how the Lord your God led you through the wilderness for those 40 years, humbling you and testing you to prove your character and to find out whether or not you would obey his commands. Yes, he humbled you by letting you go hungry and then feeding you with manna, a food previously unknown to you and your ancestors. He did it to teach you that God's people do not live by bread alone. Rather, we live by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. For all these 40 years, your clothes did not wear out, your feet didn't blister or swell. And then in verse five from the NASB, so you are to know in your heart that the Lord your God was disciplining you just as a man disciplines his son. You are to know in your heart that God that the Lord your God was disciplining you as a man disciplines his son. So how did God discipline the, people, the children of Israel? They wandered around in the desert for 40 years. And yet, during that entire period of being disciplined, God was protecting them. They were still being disciplined. They weren't allowed into the promised land. And, and 40 years of walking in circles, very much a discipline. But he met all their needs. He provided them with manna. Their clothing did not wear out. 40 years, same clothes. Walking for 40 years in circles, and their foot did not swell. So God was with them through it. And that's the, that's the takeaway message here. God was with them through their, their time of discipline, just as he is with, during our times of trials. You know, we're told that even the tiniest sparrow is marked in its fall, that God's numbered the, the hairs on our head. And even when we go through difficult times, be they trials or being disciplined, which really means that, you know, we are the, the cause of it ultimately, God was protecting them. God was with them. God was trying to uh, encourage them and give them an opportunity to, to rely on him, to trust in him. They were still being taught a lesson. They were still uh, had to endure that punishment. But God also showed them grace by providing 
the manna, providing for their clothing, providing for their feet, their footwear, or probably not their probably bare feet, but you know, that their feet didn't swell. And that's how we're, that's the example that we're supposed to have as far as discipline for our children. Lovingly, but with restraint. We still protect them. They still need to be disciplined. They still need to be corrected. But corrected with the sense and the intent of instructing and teaching, not disciplining for the sake of punishment. I didn't put it on the screen, but um, a couple other verses, Ephesians 6, verse 4, Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. We have to be careful because punishment is punitive, where discipline is corrective. And if we're too harsh, we can provoke them to anger um, instead of teaching them to do better. Proverbs 19, and, uh, Proverbs 19 verse 18 says to discipline your son while there is hope and do not desire his death. So again, it's discipline with the sense of correction, not a punishment. This other word, discipline your son while there's hope, while there's still hope, depending on the translation. That's, that's an interesting concept. While there, discipline them while there is still hope. That implies that there's a window of time where we can effectively discipline our children. And, you know, any of us who've had children get that very quickly, right? They're, they're, there's an age where they're impressionable and they will listen to us and they will abide by what we say. And then as they get older, um, that opportunity closes. So that's what, that's what it's referring to. It's so like, while, you know, discipline your son while there's still hope, but before they get too far into whatever they're doing uh, or before they get too old and they're no longer uh, malleable. So we do have that model um, for discipline for us as parents as well. Just looking at the time. Um, maybe just to kind of summarize and wrap up because we're almost out of time. So a person is diagnosed with a serious disease. Is that a test of their faith? Is it a trial to increase their faith? Is it an act of discipline? Uh, because maybe there's other issues in their life. Uh, we don't know. We can't know. And while there are distinctions between testing trials and discipline, uh, there's also overlap. It's not, a, it's not a very black and white topic. Um, but we do know, um, especially when it, it's, we're faced with it, it's not our job to judge whether somebody is going through discipline, uh, whether they're being in a trial. Our job is to support them and build one another up as believers in Christ, period. Regardless of what they're going through or how they're going through it. And again, we can think back to the story of Job and Job's friends. You know, they started off well in coming to Job's side, sitting there quietly and supporting him. And then they went off the rails because they started to judge him. And it's very easy for us to get caught up in the moment, some tragic event that's happening to someone. We don't know why God's allowing this. It's not our job to understand. It's our nature that we want to understand, but it's not our job. We need to pause, remember God's in control, He's got a plan, and he's going to work it out for their good. Let's just close in a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this uh, this look into this topic, Father. It's an important topic and one that we don't necessarily talk a lot about, Father, but we do recognize that we serve, serve you. You're a big God. You're in full control. Nothing happens without uh, your allowing it, and we just thank you for the grace that you show when we do go through difficult times, trials, discipline, that even in those, those darkest moments potentially in our lives, that you're walking alongside us. You're there to hold us up, to nurture us, and to give us the potentially the positive outcome through that experience. And so we just thank you for that, Father. We thank you that while you're the God of the universe, you care enough about each one of us that you want to, to help us grow and help us draw closer to you. And we just thank you for that. And we thank you for this opportunity to look into your word and to come together as a group of believers. And we just uh, commit the rest of this evening into your care. In Jesus' name, amen.